Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to Parallel for uh, organizing this great speaker series. Um, I'm Trent. Uh, I'm the co-founder of an NFT curation protocol called JPEG. We allow kind of anyone to curate exhibitions of NFTs regardless of ownership on our platform, hoping to build this uh, kind of decentralized provenance network. Um, and we have a lovely lineup of speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, Sina Gustafson is uh, to my left here with uh, the Department of Decentralization, which does really phenomenal research into uh, a kind of number of crypto economic and NFT related uh, endeavors. Um, I'll let her kind of give more of an introduction there. Um, then we have Sam Spike, who is uh, my fellow co-founder at JPEG and also the kind of lead curator and creative director at Fingerprints, which is a fantastic um, uh, collector DAO that specializes in blockchain-based art. Um, we have Patrick Tresset. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, my French does not exist. Um, uh, who is a artist and curator working mainly in the Tezos ecosystem. Um, uh, with a long history of also physical uh, physical art as well. Um, and then we have Johanna Neuschaffer, <laughs> um, who uh, is the uh, curator and uh, co-founder of Office in Part, which is a uh, gallery and exhibition space based in Berlin. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I think to kick things off, it would be great to uh, get a little bit more background in terms of uh, what you all do in the in the NFT space and, and how curation plays into that. Um, uh, and maybe just like one of the, the recent fun NFT projects or, you know, NFT related things that you've done recently. Go for it. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Trent introduced me, I'm Stina Gustafsson. I'm an independent curator and art strategist um, specializing in art and blockchain. I've been doing so since 2018, um, which is also when I co-founded the art research department at Department of Decentralization. Um, we're a blockchain foundation that's based in Berlin. Uh, we've done a bunch of different works. We've written two reports of, uh, about the intersection of art and blockchain, one released in 2019, one released in 2021. And the most recent project we did, we did was with uh, a big collaboration with Hito Steril uh, and the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn in Germany. Um, the latest project that I did that was really fun and exciting was an exhibition that I curated in Amsterdam called um, Art in the Blockchain, where we placed NFTs within a context of digital art and also presented um, the wider practices of the artists who are um, working with NFTs and um, showing that they've actually been working with dig digital art for, for a really long time. Great. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, so I'm Sam. My background was in the traditional art world. Uh, before I joined the NFT space, I was working as an independent um, researcher and curator in London, which is where, that I, where I'm from. Um, I was specifically working on an exhibition project at the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is uh, the art museum of the University of Cambridge, uh, looking at the inter well, looking at the way that objects um, are represented in both painting and cinema. And then about a year and a half ago, I somehow stumbled down the rabbit hole of crypto, NFTs, digital, um, the digital art market. Um, I quickly met Trent and we began building JPEG together, which he's given a very good and succinct description of. Um, I uh, quickly found my way as well into um, this group called Fingerprints, which is a basically a sort of digital community that formed around a collection of artworks. Um, and that community has continued to grow its collection specifically of um, artwork that's really engaging with blockchain technology as an artistic medium in its own right, rather than purely a commercial medium. Uh, we have a, this collection, and we also now work uh, closely with artists to develop new projects in that vein. One of those projects, the most recent project that I was a part of, um, was a presentation that we did at Art Dubai Fair in Dubai in early March. Uh, where we work with a German artist group called Terra Zero, who are very interested in the way that uh, blockchain technology can be used to confer autonomy and financial sovereignty on natural systems. Um, the work that we exhibited there was called 
seed capital. It basically involved a plant that was connected to two sensors. The sensors measured the temperature in the room and the moisture in the soil. Every 15 minutes, as long as the conditions in the soil and the air were beneficial to the health of the plant, the uh, plant essentially issued an NFT that could be purchased by anybody online. But if the conditions were not correct, if the room was too uh, dry, too hot, uh, then no NFT was generated and there was nothing for sale. So it was an artwork that sort of was modeling a scenario whereby uh, the exhibiting institution, in our case, Fingerprints, had a, a very direct economic incentive to ensure the best possible conditions for the survival of this plant. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Patrick. Uh, I am uh, an artist uh, based in Brussels, uh, active in new media mainly. And um, I got involved in, with NFT by necessity uh, due to COVID, all the exhibition dried down and uh, most of my income and uh, occupation came from exhibiting rather than selling. So I, I, I started with NFT. I waited a bit before of the, because of the environmental concerns. Um, so the, it kept Nuke appeared on Tezos, and then I got really involved into that because I was on it on the first week. I got really involved, and a few months later, uh, with Diane Dubré, we, we, we created a, a group, a gallery that's called Alteren, where we try to do experiments to bring the traditional art world to NFT or to do experiments like that. It's both a collective and artist and an online marketplace. Um, but small, it's more a gallery rather than a big marketplace. Uh, and an interesting project we did recently was the, with the Aksenov Foundation, which is a big, uh, actually a big Russian foundation. Um, and we did that a few months ago with them, where they chose some artists from their collections and introduced them to NFTs, and they had an exhibition in, in our, uh, on our platform. And it was very interesting because they asked all their artists that are in the collection, and actually the artists who were interested were young women or old men artists. And they, and they really played the game, so they, they created some pieces specially to be minted as an FT. And it was a very interesting experience as a, as a bridge like that uh, between the two. Hi, I'm Johanna, and I'm very sorry my voice is not getting better than this, but I'm very happy that I have a microphone, so um, sorry for that. Um, yes, I'm uh, Johanna Neuschaffer, and I'm um, co-founder of Office and Part, together with my colleague Anne Schwanz, who's at the moment in Berlin. Right now, we are actually at uh, the fair with the booth, where we mainly show physical pieces, but um, with Office and Part, that is existing for now almost four years, we um, work with artists, we are a contemporary multidimensional platform, so we have a space, but we do also a lot of digital um, exhibitions, but also digital um, art mediation, so we really believe that um, also the art world in general has to um, has the chance with the digitalization um, to really get out of the normal comfort zone. So when NFTs came, um, it were different ways we got engaged with it. And the one hand is that we work with some artists that are working with um, digital media that work like Jonas Lund, who also works with us, and you probably have heard in the talk before, um, who are, um, of course, um, have a, um, um, in NFT or blockchain had an impact on their work, and so there was a lot of discussion going on over the last one and a half years, especially. And um, then in um, l um, this uh, this year in um, February, we um, did a collaborative exhibition project, um, NFT Net Art from Net Art to Art NFT, it was called, and we did it in Berlin physically in Panke Gallery in an hour space, and we collaborated with JPEG Space, and this is actually the first time we got an engaged with JPEG as great um, partners for the show. Um, and the show was um, uh, showing nine international artists that work with, um, or that showed NFTs, um, or work with NFTs, but worked with digital art for a very long time. And um, for us to make um, this show, it was really the moment where we realized that it was very important to um, 
get the art world and this art mediation out into an audience who is not so familiar with the NFT world as well and that um, we, we had the feeling that there were so many prejudices that um, NFT is certainly an art form that came up and um, the artists uh, do GIFs and JPEGs and, and um, that a lot of them are doing digital or generative art for a long time was not really seen. So that project was um, in one hand very interesting and very important for the, um, for the traditional art world or for mediation between these worlds. So this is um, the latest show that we did um, in this um, field. Um, we are also part of the exhibition here, um, which is also on, um, on, on JPEG, with four artists, with Kim Avesendorf, um, Cornelia Solfrank, um, Lia and um, Jonas Lund. So we are part of the FAIR concept with Parallel. And um, we are right now um, working together with the two fantastic other ladies on a report, the Art and Tech Report, Art NFT Collecting, um, where we really um, got a survey about how and why people buy art NFTs and what might be a difference or the importance about that. And um, it should come out next week. So um, if you want to check it out, it's Art and Tech Report, but uh, I can, of course, a little bit more to that later. Yeah, I think I don't speak too so long though. Um, yeah, we would definitely love to hear some of the, uh, the insights from that report. It sounds um, obviously perfect for this discussion on collecting and curating, um, which I think at JPEG, we, over the past eight, nine months that, that we've been working on it, have had a lot of discussions just like around what curation actually is and what its role is, what it's for, and what constitutes curation. We allow anyone to essentially create an exhibition on the platform of, of NFTs, and so there's some deep professionalization going on there of, of curation as a concept, but uh, it's obviously open to everyone, so we obviously want the, the professionals and the art-trained uh, curators to, to be participating in that as well. Um, and in general, there's, there's just this uh, interesting intertwining of, of collection and curation, obviously, that, that goes on and kind of the interplay between those, those two things. Um, and I think with the, the group of uh, panelists that we have here, I think everyone probably has slightly different ways in which they engage with what that purpose of curation is and how that relates to, to collection. Um, and so I'd love to hear just kind of from, from each of your perspectives or you know, whoever has some specific thoughts on this, just what, what does that relationship look like in, in your kind of specific works context? Um, and what, what is curation really for and its, and its purpose? Sam, maybe to you specifically, <laughs> specifically as a collector DAO, how does Fingerprints think about um, yep. think about that interplay? I, I thought I might get singled out. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have uh, so Fingerprints. I should preface by saying is a DAO. For those who don't know what a DAO is, it's a stands for this rather um, unfriendly term: decentralized autonomous organization. What that really boils down to in actual fact in kind of day to day is that we are an organization that's structured a little bit like a cooperative. We're you know, spread around all over the globe. Um, our sort of funds are all on the blockchain. We all coordinate um, via um, you know, online chat, chat rooms and forums, and we try to be as horizontally structured as possible. So although we now have people who are in positions of responsibility and oversee parts of the organization, we um, allow any of our members, and anybody can join if they purchase membership, we allow any of our members to uh, participate in decision making and projects and um, to vote on important sort of both op operational decisions. Um, so with this collective of people who collectively owns work, we um, have, we are sort of known as a so-called curation DAO in the space, which is interesting because really we are private, private collectors. But I think that what our collection has become and potentially the way we, we fashioned it is, is somewhat akin to what a museum collection is in the traditional world. We, we are a, a, a private organization, so we're not a public institution, but um, we have a semi-permanent collection. 
Um, we have, you know, obviously a financial interest in that collection, and that financial interest, among other things, leads us to want to um, really like tell the story of that work and express its importance um, as best we possibly can, which means that we're very interested in education in the same way that museums are very focused on education. Um, I think we're curators in the sense that a curator is not just somebody who goes around picking things out, obviously, but also um, a sort of steward of kinds or a caretaker. I mean, it's often said that you know the term curation stems from the Latin to care, and we care for our work um, by trying to contextualize it and by trying to work closely with the artists whose work we own to support their careers. So we're not only like a museum in that respect, we're also like a gallery. And that's where what a DAO is or can be begins to get a little bit weird because we don't fall exactly into these kind of ready-made categories that you find in the art world. We're not a gallery, we're not a museum, um, we're not a group of independent curators, but we're some kind of combination of all of those things. Um, so, but our means of, our means of curation is, is, is via collection, um, and that is not a, a new thing, I wouldn't say. You know, museum collections, many of them, think of the Frick Collection in New York, for example, right? It was Henry Clay Frick's private collection that became a public institution, and sort of that, that relationship is, is many centuries old. Yeah, so there's this, this idea from the collector side of, yeah, really collection being the, the curation inherently, um, which, is obviously nothing new to the to the traditional art world, but I think it feels like the gallery ecosystem, the their like curation is for the 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 end goal of collection. Um, does that feel right to you, Johanna? Um, and kind of how does that play out in uh, your work at at Office in Park? Um, yes, I think this is very interesting because, of course, there are certain um, aspects of curating. And, of course, as a gallery or as somebody who works very close with artists and builds up artists' careers, you curate your own artist um, group that you work with. So every gallery um, has, or every everyone who works with a, 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 yeah, a group of artists has their own um, very subjective um, um, hand, handwriting from that. So on the one hand, yes, that is the one thing. But of course, on the other hand, and I think this is when it comes to, to the curational part where you try to get this, uh, different artists together in a, cu a curated show. And um, for example, how we did it with the NFT um, net art show. Um, you really want to find a, um, putting, you try to put this different different artists into um, a, a context where they work or speak with each other and where an audience, and I think this is for me especially obviously very important, that as a curator you also want to reach, maybe also educate an audience or help an audience to understand the variety of, of, a, of a topic or of a subject. And, and, um, and, and you don't really do that so much when you work with artists or your artist group. You like each individual artist and sometimes they are not from the same type of what they are doing or that same direction. But when you put a show together and um, you use your knowledge that you have gained over the years or that you were specialized in and you um, bring in different positions in order to um, make the outline even larger. Uh, the out, yeah, the outline even larger. And I think um, if you create it well, then the next step is you have to educate it. You have to mediate it very well. And I think this is something that for for where we are all now at the moment, that there is a technology like blockchain revolutionizing in a way digital art um, appearance um, and being a little bit also the the fear of the traditional art world, because we always say there is this digital and crypto art world and there's this traditional. We are not at the point so far that we can just say there is this art world, because we are still, we, it's still a big discovery at the moment going on. And I think this is the next step, especially when it comes to digital exhibitions or to um, NFT-based or blockchain-based um, curations, to find the right uh, way to, to mediate it and to gain the audience and bring the topics of the artist 
to, to the audience. And the one uh, last point about that is also interesting because we did the show physically and um, unfortunately I haven't seen Stina's show, but um, I, I think it must have been amazing. And um, it, um, it, it sounded really, really good and what I saw, it was fantastic. And, and I think this is the, the interesting part is when you have artists working with uh, artists working with digital and physical for a long time. Um, how do you show it? How do you curate it? And how do you use this amazing moment that you can show it to an audience physically in a space or somewhere and also get a digital audience as well? So you can combine it and it's not either or, but you can do both together. And I think this is the amazing challenge that we are in now. And it's not just with blockchain based or digital art in general. I think this actually ties very well with like what you were saying about caring as well, because I think it is very much about caring. Um, but it's not just about the act of caring. Like care also means the act of translating, the act of putting in context, the act of ca caring. Yeah, of course, the act of um, educating, etc. And I think this is like is exactly that. It's it it is an act of care, but it's not just it's not just that. The act of care means so much more. And I think. That is both relevant to when you are a collector, but it's also relevant when you're an independent curator like myself. Um, I'm quite glad that I'm working with a lot of art pieces that I don't own and that I will never own because I, I also think that um, collecting and ownership comes with um, quite a big burden and that, that is both relatable to physical pieces, but also digital pieces. pieces. And I think maybe Maybe right now it's such a, it's such a novel and new thing that that burden of dig digital pieces is not necessarily considered quite yet, um, but probably will be in the future. Um, because you have to care for them. You have to care for them. If they're in your possession, you have to continue caring for them, um, which means preservation, etc. And that is also not um, something that's always super easy when it comes to, um, to digital pieces. So I think collecting and curating both means caring. Yes, yes, that's, uh, yeah, yes, that's, I, I totally agree with that. There is something specific with, uh, with NFTs, I mean, you already mentioned it, is that the curators are mainly the collectors. And they are really the people who, who influence, and are, uh, and it's really diff. It's yeah, it's normally very different role, and there are not that many strong curators in NFTs that are totally detached from uh, from the, from the collectors. And the problem of the collectors is that they're courted by artists and they influence other collectors and things like that and the, the, the one of the other problems is that there's no exhib you are doing exhibitions but there's no real exhibitions of nfts uh, there are some in the, in the physical world that are attempted that generally are not presented as artwork they're more presented as collection of screens and uh, that really i think where there's a lot of things to, to to invent and to explore on, uh, on the system. Um, <coughs> on Alteran, so the, 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 the organization we, we created, the first step we tried was just to present the artworks as artworks. So a single rather than a catalog like on most marketplaces or places. Actually, there, there's no there's not really any exhibition space online for NFTs. Most of them are marketplaces, which is totally different things. Uh, and I think there's a lot of space to invent. But you're doing it already with JPEG, with an effort on the presentation. And, um, and after, yeah, the, the role of the, the creator is very important, and, and it's really missing, I think, in NFTs, in, in making sense of all that. And, uh, because there's so many uh, excellent things amongst NFT, it's, it's, yeah, it needs a bit of guidance, I think, by, uh, by I think, traditional curators from the from outside. I think. Yeah, it's a great point that uh, most of the ways in which you currently kind of like find, discover, and ultimately purchase an NFT is just through a marketplace that can oftentimes feel a lot like eBay. There is no context going on. There is no 
kind of like emphasis on the uh, the work or the artist and um, yeah, it, it feels very transactional and it does create this this element in which um, you know if there are curators, it is only after they the curator has collected the the work. Um, uh, the other thing I would kind of touch on in those those comments was again this idea of caring for the work that you are all talking about the the word stewardship I don't think like or even care does not come up in kind of NFT conversations uh, that that we see happening but it's clearly something that um, you know between all of the you know hacks that we see of various NFT wallets getting compromised or fished you know their their private keys um, things of that nature there needs to be a lot more education about how we you know do uh, properly own and care for these these assets. Um, it's also a great, it, Sarah Friend's uh, life forms also is obviously like directly in, in conversation with this idea of, of stewardship, these, these NFTs that um, uh, will die if they are not properly cared for and sent to another, uh, to another address upon a specified time interval. Um, so it's like these things are literally alive and, and without, uh, without the proper stewardship, they will all disappear. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is, is really clear, um, kind of a, as you were talking, Johanna, is that we do have this, like, this art world and then this crypto world that are uh, intersecting. Um, and there's a lot of education and kind of uh, dialogue that, that needs to happen to kind of merge those two things. Um, but we are also seeing that there's now kind of, there's a, um, kind of like taste making power in the NFT world and a taste making power in the in the traditional art world and they're very different they're very different powers and I think uh, and like locuses of power and when we talk about collecting and curating I think of those things really add up to to taste making and kind of what people are interested in um, so I'm curious uh, kind of how you guys see um, see those kind of like different different taste making apparatuses, apparati, um, uh, and kind of where, um, where they're each focusing their, their attention. Yeah, um, I think curate, I mean, in my experience, because I come from the, well, actually from new media, which is, which is not really the art world because it was not commercial. Like I never saw, well, I sold some drawings, but otherwise I never sold an installation. I've sold far more things with the NFTs. Um, so, so I'm not familiar with, the, with actually the commercial art world. There's, there's non-commercial art world and now there's the NFT. But I've never seen a curator as a test maker. It's more test detectors. Or, or, or things like that. And, and it's true that in the NFT, there's more this idea of influences, uh, which I don't think, well, it does exist in the art world, but not with the same name, so it's more discreet. And, and in my experience, creators are people yeah, who select, who find things interesting that work together for shows, but they're also filters. So they, because, well, if you work, you have to be able to work professionally, you know, especially in new media, you need things that work, that you exist and things like that. And they're more like different level of filters, I think, the, I mean, active filters, not passive filters for creators. And in the, yeah, in crypto, it's very, very different, uh, the thing, because again, it's the collectors and the, the, the things that make the money. And, Actually, the selection goes through also, which is something very important, is people who sell the most. Uh, that, that is uh, the test making, the, the thing. Yeah. I think, <coughs> sorry. I think um, it's very interesting that um, when you enter the NFT space, and um, maybe let me talk about art NFTs, which of course can you be, um, uh, the definition is, of course, also like the uh, same with art, always different or difficult. But if you try to um, think of um, artistic pieces that are made um, be, uh, by a creator that wants to engage also in the art world, um, I think this is for the fir f first. This is a definition, or this is a direction that you have to um, get. And then it's at the end um, 
whatever the curator or a curator um, puts into context with each other, this will evolve. And I think the one thing that is very interesting is that at the moment, everything when you hear the word NFT, that's always involved with a price. I mean, that's the, that's the thing with an NFT because it's minted and it only exists with a price. It always only exists as, it, as soon as it's online, it has a price. And this is very interesting when it comes to um, experiencing and, um, and looking at art. Um, when you curate a show as a curator or maybe also as a gallery, if you, or if you work with an artist, it's not the first thing that you look at, that you look, oh, is he performing well? Is he successful? And um, um, a show is also suc is successful if the context is good and the story is told well. And not if they all sold out or easily dropped and sent, um, sold out fast. And I think this is, this is a big, big thing that is still um, the question. So what is defining quality? Is defining quality a sold out piece? Or is it quality a good artwork? And of course, what is a good artwork? But I think this is something that we also figured out in the in the uh, report that is coming out soon. And I, of course, only will say some things about it. Um, but it's also something that we've felt that people are who are in this scene and want to collect NFTs or art NFTs, NFTs because they value the art and the artist. That is the main focus, and it's not the price. And I think there is there is a vast difference in, in, in the audience and, and and the creation or the the selection of people or or, or groups you do, you're looking at when you're talking about NFTs or NFT groups. So I think that's very important that that the price thing is that you try to get rid of the idea that this is defining a successful piece. It's actually really interesting that you mentioning that because um, for the exhibition in Amsterdam, we did tours and we had kind of a 50-50 audience of 50% crypto blockchain and 50% um, art, art crowd from Amsterdam. And um, a lot of the times when we were talking about NFTs and such from the crypto audience, we did get the question, has it sold out? How much did it sell for? Um, whereas for the art audience, we there was never a question about the price or you know if it was sold or out or anything. That was more kind of questions around the practice from the artist, etc. Um, so it was very much um, from the blockchain crypto a huge focus on on the price and yes. how quickly it sold out, etc. Yeah, no, I mean it is. I mean it should, uh, but it is a bit of. of of a problem, and I think it's a, a bit. It is a problem for artists because there is this thing that still things have to sell very quickly, otherwise they are valueless, and it creates. And also, people say how much they sold, and it really creates something negative for artists who, who sell less or more slowly. And that is one of the things. But it's, I think so. Also we speak about NFTs, but it's only one year old. I mean, one year that it has picked up. So things will sold himself and I, I think it's going to, it's to settle down. Sorry that I, I, I want to say something to that because um, um, Art and Tech Report, um, um, we had a survey um, on uh, 2021 on buying art online and it was very interesting because it's very interesting how the market also the traditional did, um, art market is changing so um, there was a survey where we tried to ask um, where we asked collectors how they would purchase or how they or why they purchase art that they haven't uh, art online but it was physical art or it was about physical mainly about physical art only eight percent talked about media art it was like we came out and then the NFTs came. The NFT hype came. But it was very interesting because everybody told us we want to see prices. This was like nine out of 10 people wanted to have prices of the artworks. We are at an art fair. There are no prices every, anywhere. And if you ask people who go walk around the fair, I would say at least 80% would say, we want to see the prices, where are they? And and so it's funny because I think it's also, the NFT is like, or the, this, this whole um, movement is, is showing a direction where the art world wants to evolve to in a way, but they are too, too stiff to go there right now. And, and so I think it's a very nice um, example that, of course, I also think it's important that in the NFT world or in the NFT context, it's good not to talk just about prices. But on the other hand, I think it's also important for the art market to talk about prices in general. And so I think it's a very nice, this is why I just wanted to add it as a nice example.
Well, the prices are, as you guys are saying, always, always there. And it's one of the interesting dynamics that it's not just there when, you know, a gallery or an auction house is trying to sell them. They're there 100% of the time. And so a lot of times you have, you know, someone who did not collect with a long-term view of this thing and <laughs> they want uh, to see their, their return and they're not seeing their return so they can just go list that at any time of the, of the day. And so you end up getting this, um, this dynamic where someone lists something you know, b below floor, as we call it, and uh, below kind of what anything else in the collection is, is selling for, and then it still doesn't sell, and then you know, someone else goes below that. And so there's just this really rapid price discovery that happens that, especially in these uh, really kind of like high velocity markets, there's no real opportunity for the type of education and um, kind of like cultural value to seep into these things. It's kind of a constant hype, hype market and a, you know, clamber for attention. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's also, I mean, I, I, I'm new to the field, but like everybody else, uh, but th there is this thing that is very specific. First, it's crypto money, so there are tokens, and psychologically, you don't attach it to dollars or euros. There is this detachment. And there is a thing that a, a lot of the, the crypto collectors are fairly young, I mean, the most active one. And there is this game thing. It is a game for a lot of people. And this idea that you've made money and that you've increased and everybody wants the same thing, it is really closer to a game to rather than the physical collecting thing. First, collecting physical thing is far slower because you have to take it to the gallery, you have to find a shipper to bring it to your thing, you have to bring it. And when, you know, with the NFTs, you can, you can be sold three, three times in a day. Um, but the, the game thing is very important in, in the NFT, which, and it's why this value is, uh, works like that at the moment. It might change. But, uh, but I don't know. I, I mean, on Tezos, I think it's people never take the money out. You know, they keep playing, playing, playing. <laughs> but they, so they, they have the impression of making money. But it's, it's, it's not money. It's just if you keep playing, it's not. It's psychological value rather than real value. So, so the game thing is very important, the money game thing. And I also think that's maybe because, as you were saying, you know, the average age of the participants in these markets is lower. So what did these people grow up? How, what, what was kind of like the um, most prominent kind of collection paradigm that these people grew up with? It was Pokemon or it was, you know, something like that. It's like, you know, and that's the kind of approach that people are taking a lot of the time. It's like it's a gamified form of collection. Um, and obviously there are many other forms of gamified collection, collecting baseball cards or collecting whatever else it is. Um, but I think that it's more within that paradigm or some evolution of that paradigm than it is a, you know, um, traditional fine art paradigm of, of collection. I just wanted to say on the sort of financialization part that I think that, you know, financialization and speculation is always going to be at the forefront of the conversation for as long as the NFT part of things is foregrounded. Because the NFT is fundamentally a sort of financial instrument, right? It's a token um, issued on a blockchain which was solved, which was a technology that was invented to solve a um, you know, financial problem. And uh, the word token itself like inherently implies some kind of tradability. Um, of course, you know, if it just facilitates commerce and facilitates a process of commodification, it can happen behind the scenes, just like we can modify the world around us and we don't have to talk about it all the time. But for as long as we're having conversations about NFTs and for as long as the market is self-consciously involved in like collecting NFTs, then yes, financialization and speculation are going to be you know, part of the conversation. And that has many downsides to it. Um, maybe, Johanna, as you were saying, one um, inadvertent, or not inadvertent rather, but one um, interesting kind of possible advantage is that it introduces some kind of um, greater honesty into the market. You know, nobody can be sheepish about speaking about prices. Nobody can be sheepish about participating in 
um, this kind of capitalist system because it's right there, um, public and indisputable, and it's what everybody's um, involved in. Well. I think there are tricks you can overcome with this as well. So I think this is a little bit of an illusion I found out in a way that this transparency is also only transparent if you want it to be transparent. Um, so um, I think uh, yes and no. I think you can also. How trick could you conceal? How do you conceal that? <laughs> I've just heard some stuff. Um, no, but I think of course um, this transparency is there. But I, I think there is still um, there are still some. Not that de not so decentralized rules applying now, um, as well. Although you, there is, I just I just feel it's not that far from this classical art world in in, in in certain aspects, and and that's also interesting. And of course, it's um, it's how systems also work. So I think it's an illusion to think that now everything is decentralized and everything is um, transparent. There is also tricks, but um, yeah. Yes, this, I mean, the, there are groups of collectors, investors that, that make the market change. Uh, oh, of course. Which, which would be uh, not legal in other contexts. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, but no, I, I just wanted to, to, to come back to what I said, is that we are talking about the most visible part of the NFT and the collectors who hold and do really, or, who try to build a collection, a coherent collection, do a really, we don't hear that much about that. This is uh, the outspoken uh, people, so all these frosts and things and money and things. It's not all like that. There is this underground thing of people doing collecting work like exist in, in, in Real life art world. Yeah, it's not, uh, we are just, uh, that's the problem is that the surface is so bubbly and active. But, uh, I mean, it's one of the beautiful things with NFT is the, is the energy that there is. Because of all the youth and, and things, and all the money, I mean, this money makes everything sparkle, doesn't it? I think you're 100% right about that. There, I mean, there's lots of projects. Sarah Friend, for example, um, who's a brilliant, brilliant artist. She's done a uh, project off and life forms. And both those projects are very, very, very reasonable price. Off was sold for $35 per piece. Life forms is sold for $19, I believe. But these are also not necessarily the pieces and the sensational prices that we're being presented in the media. I mean, we do hear the 96 millions, you know, selling out within seconds, etc. So there's definitely lots of projects who's thinking more about the technology, who's not selling for the same prices, but it's maybe not sensational enough for it to end up in the in the light. Yeah, there's. I think I think another element of this is just. Uh, kind of a financial populism kind of thing that we see in the world right now. Um, I think there's a direct line between something like the GameStop AMC uh, activities and what we see in NFTs, this, this realization that uh, globalized communities online can get together and do really wild financial things that previously were thought to only uh, be attainable by, um, you know, organizations and kind of shadowy entities that were extremely well capitalized, um, which I think is just, just a really fascinating element to, to all of this. But I think the financial aspect of the token is, is really interesting and kind of and fundamental, right? But equally fundamental is the, the media itself. Um, and the way in which we access NFT media is, you know, it's on a public blockchain. Anyone can see it, anyone can put their own spin on it, anyone can curate it, uh, kind of as, as we allow anyone to, to do. Um, which I think is also quite different from even the history of uh, some of the way in which digital, digital art has been curated in the past. Um, so I'm curious what that kind of new distribution of not only the the kind of token element, but also just the, the fundamental media, the actual art itself, um, has kind of on this this uh, these dynamics of collecting and curating that we see. 
Yeah, it's, I have I just triggered another idea, so I'm not going to answer your question at all. But no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, no, no. What I mean, one of the amazing things that I discovered when I joined the NFT, and especially on Tezos, where there was this, 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 this thing because it was cheap to mint, which was not the case on Ethereum, is that all those artists totally appeared, came on the radar, and Personally, I realized that there were so many excellent artists, digital artists or new media artists that I had no idea of. And that was the amazing thing. I mean, the, and, and that was uh, the thing. And, and it's still, the, to go back to what you were saying about the way to display or to present the work, it is still a problem because it's still something you consume on your computer or on, on your phone, which means that the medium is different than from something you would show in the gallery. And, I, I, and, and so your, the, the meaning of expression of the medium is different. So you have to change your medium or create a new medium, create a new expression to be able to exhibit it in this way, I think. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to add, because this is something that um, that is part of equation, but it's also part of um, the, the one way is how to present it in a way, to, to bring it into context. But the other big question is, and I think it comes more close together than I thought, is what do I do with all these NFTs that I have in my wallet? So is it also nice to trade it because otherwise it's somewhere where I don't really touch it. And, and of course it's a digital piece and you don't need to touch it, but something, this is this something um, that must drive me to keep it, maybe. Yeah, the only, the only interaction you have with an NFT often is the buy and sell function. So of course you're gonna press those, press those buttons. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I know several people here do some physical exhibitions, obviously, right? Um, how do you think about, uh, and what would you recommend for you know, people that own NFTs to, kind of actually spend time with them and like how to think about um, that, that element of uh, this thing basically living in the, the computer versus you know, what I'm used to it being on my, on my wall. I, I mean, I, first straight and foremost, I would, I would just say don't necessarily go and like just buy for the sake of buying, like maybe, <laughs> maybe a bit more <laughs> consideration in terms of the pieces that you really want and really mean something is maybe a good approach. Because um, I, I really do believe in this, like that ownership comes with a burden. And I think we're not, we're not even touching on, upon the burden that digital assets are going to mean for us in the future. I mean, we've had a uh, Netflix series about Marie Kondo coming into your flat, helping you cleaning it out. That's going to be about the wallet in the future. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think that's basically one of the main things that we're going to have to start to consider in the future is this like take a step away from this blind minting for the sake of just minting to own it. If it doesn't mean anything for you, why, why should you own it then just for the sake of having it? It might mean something more for someone else. Maybe it's better for them to have it instead. Um, it's like a very selfish motivation for the moment. It's a very individualistic my thing, maybe that's something, or I think that's something that we need to consider in the future. It's an, in the end, it's an, it's a, it's an NFT, but it's, it's also an art piece. It's, it's an art piece that you have, so yeah. Be a bit more considerate in terms of what you buy. I would probably <laughs> say it's a good approach or good, a good way to start. I think you're right. But, uh, I mean, one of, uh, of the beauty of the thing is that we are before the beginning in some way. And one of the beauty also is that we can do what we want. So if we have an idea or like you do, you can create your company or create your site or your marketplace. You can do with your own ideas. And that's one of the beauty with NFT is that it doesn't exist yet. I mean, we are just not even at the beginning. And that's, uh, you can imagine any kind of this does get back to again where these kind of like the sources of taste making are coming from in the NFT world are, as Patrick was saying, largely the the influencers who 
are definitely minting as much as they can and then tweeting about it as much as they can and then selling it as much as they they can. Um, not in all cases, but uh, we do see a lot of that. Um, and so, like, the care that, that we're talking about on this stage is, again, not what is being talking, talked about in the NFT space. Um, how, like, what's the route to getting more attention on a more thoughtful approach to NFTs? Um, and kind of like, is there anything that, that we can do that the traditional art world can do that like the NFT space can start to do? Um, or what could happen to, to start to um, kind of meld those, those worlds a little bit? So with our, with our turn, one of the ideas that, that was things was really to show artworks as artworks, so to, to try to see that. So you go in the, in the space, it's designed to slow down, to see one artwork by an artwork. You have the presentation of the artist and so on and so forth. And one, we wanted actually the op to do the opposite, and that was a mistake. We wanted to bring the traditional artwork to NFT, but more um, institutions or things like that. So first, it's very difficult to, to do that. It's, uh, we've tried to give an NFT for free, so people, we did an experiment with a French company called Asmona, where they sent through their mailing a thing, so people, we would open a wallet for them, put, put few tezos, and they would have to go to the website to collect the thing. And even that was extremely difficult. We did it another time, and that nobody did the effort of going to, to get the NFT when it was free, and we even gave them money to to do it, just, uh, just to do the, the, the movement of the thing and choosing the artwork. Um, so, and we, we didn't, uh, we are only now doing the opposite, which is what you were talking about, is that going towards the crypto. Uh, and that was a big mistake, because at the moment, to fund the, those, those kind of experiments, we have to go towards the existing crypto collectors and not alienate them with contemporary art ideas and things like that. It has to be, but it has to be quite slow because it's, uh, I think we're trying to go far too fast in this. I think for us, it's very simple. We wanna just exhibit um, and uh, present very interesting artistic positions that we believe in. And it can be crypto, it can be physical, it can be anything. And at the end, this is what we will do. And I think, um, and it's good, because we just believe in it. And it sounds very simple, but it is, that's it. I think that's true. And I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think that this flipping and this kind of endless minting is gonna go anywhere. I think that's always gonna be part, part of it, but that doesn't mean that we have to participate in it. We can we can do it in a different way. Maybe it's you know allowing for longer times, allowing for a bit more consideration, etc. The way that we work, and if that if that's how we do it, and maybe people see how how it could potentially be done, maybe more will join. But I mean, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. But yeah, we don't need to be part of it. And I I think it comes back to introducing maybe some nuance into the conversation where we can begin to draw a distinction between NFTs as this monolithic category and as, you know, a species, a new species of object, um, of digital objects that maybe also, you know, behaves in certain ways that are new um, and digital art in and of itself. I mean, when I said you can't conceal it, I didn't mean, of course, you can conceal sales and you can conceal how much people paid for things. What you can't conceal is the fact that the majority of participants are trading NFTs in the same way that people using Robin Hood are trading equities. That's what you can't conceal. And th those people are trading them not as artworks, they're trading them as NFTs. But, you know, if we can move the conversation or some of the conversation away from this, you know, category of NFTs towards the category of, let's say, new media or digital art, then I think it's about, you know, telling people the history and the significance and the, you know, contemporary importance of artwork made using digital media. It's a long history. It's not something that, you know, started last year. Um, and it's, you know, of like utmost kind of, um, 
like immediate importance to us as people who engage and interface and live via digital technologies, right? So I think it's moving the conversation in that direction. Of course, we need, you know, better, um, also better education around display methods, around what screen should I be using to display my things, about the um, impermanence and fragility of digital objects, which are just as fragile, if not more so, than physical objects. But I think that's where the conversation needs to go, right? Is away from the NFT discourse towards a discourse around digital art. I think, writ large, people are really guilty of this uh, um, element of talking about NFTs as a monolith. And I think we, even on this stage tonight, have kind of been like conflating a lot of different elements of the NFT ecosystem as, you know, kind of all one thing. But it's basically like if you were talking about media generally and we were talking about like Marvel movies in the same uh, sentence as, you know, what's being exhibited uh, down the street at at, um, at the fair. Uh, and it just doesn't actually make that much sense. It would actually be really quite interesting to really segment out and do some analysis on the works that are pretty clearly in the fine art category. And like, uh, how much of what we're even saying up here is, you know, already known to that group versus how much do they need and are interested in education? Um, and there might actually be a, a, a really strong willingness in that segment that is, you know, kind of already wanting to participate in NFTs as we're, as we're discussing, um, which I think is super, Super interesting and potentially encouraging. <laughs> I just wanted to say, there's also this one good thing that um, with this hype um, about these NFTs, there's, uh, there's uh, so many young people are now interested in art. And that's amazing. And that's a fact that is super cool. Yeah, so this is something, <laughs> something very new, is that I've met some uh, online, some young people who are getting into art to make money which is something very new. It's like, oh yeah, like before it was graphic designer or something like that. Now be an artist to make money, which is a great thing. The, the audience that we had for, for our exhibition in Amsterdam was very, very, very young. And there was quite a few art people who was like, where did they come from? We've never seen them before. Where did you find them? Um, Patrick, I would be curious as a, as an artist, um, what has it been like going from exhibiting in traditional settings to mincing on Tezos and kind of like foregoing that curatorial kind of power and, and intermediary? Um. Yeah, I mean, the, it's, I worked, but actually I did the curation myself. I worked with series and things like that. No, I mean, what was amazing with the, with the NFT and we don't, we uh, actually in this conversation we haven't talked at all, but we talk in all, all, always on NFTs. The community thing was to join this this community, which doesn't it exists a little bit in new media because most of the people in new media they go from festivals to festivals or so show like that to set up their work. So now with the pandemic it doesn't happen that much. So there was this community of uh, things you would meet the same person and you form friendships and things like that. But with the NFT, it's the same thing, but multiplied by a thousand or hundreds, this community thing. And it's also another way of kind of curating, because you, uh, on Tezos, artists collect a lot, other artists, I mean, also on Ethereum, but on Tezos, it's very expensive, extensive, so you form this community with the people you collect, and you become friends, and then you do collaborations, and things like that, and it's another way of, uh, and it, it's what we did with Alter, and this kind of organic curation, because it's people with the same affinities, with the same stories, and you imagine that you're artistic friends, and, it, it, and that is, is very different from, from the here, normal world, not normal world, physical uh, experience. Uh, you know, it, it is very interesting, um, is apart from the, all the money. Uh, the community yeah. element is such a huge yeah. part of collecting an NFT, yeah, yeah. Um, that unlike buying a physical piece, which like, okay, you get to have it, you know, in your home, you get to interact with it on a daily basis. Uh, 
when you buy an NFT, the so much of the draw for a lot of people is that you get to start interacting with these other people on a daily basis in you know the Discord, on Twitter, um, kind of wherever uh, kind of the digital watering hole that you prefer is. Um, I'm curious, uh, Stina and, and Johanna, kind of as you guys are thinking about education and you know curating physical spaces. Um, what are the ways in which you're also thinking about uh, kind of forming community and facilitating community as it as it relates to, to NFTs, potentially as spaces for greater education? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I like I don't think I necessarily consider building a community when I curate an exhibition. Um, I go for the, for the sake, if it's, a good, if it's a good exhibition, people will probably join, or hopefully they will come and see it. Um, but, yeah, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I think, it's, I think it is, um, I don't know if it's so much about building a community around these spaces, but offering a narrative, um, an insight to the medium itself and the kind of depth of complexity around it rather than just have a very two-dimensional. And from there, I think you can maybe inspire interest within learning more that could, I don't know, maybe lead to a community in the future or the willingness of learning more, etc. So I think it's more about considering the depth and the com complexity of the pieces to inspire interest rather than actually thinking too much about community when, when I do these exhibitions. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a gallery, or we, have a, we have a community, four of us in part, we have followers, we have physical followers, we have Instagram followers, we have Twitter followers, so we have a community, so for us it's pretty easy, but what we of course want to do, we want to feed this audience, and we want to grow this audience, and we want, um, and I think I'll just repeat myself, um, we want to make good exhibitions together with the artists, and we want to show that, and we want to um, show the audience how fantastic and incredible the artists are, so for us it's pretty, pretty straightforward what we do and how we do it. Yeah, I, f I forgot that communities exist so outside easy. of. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> communities existed outside of Discord. Um, right, you just know people. Um, that's cool. Um, I think I think maybe that's it. Uh, what you said it's about actually feeding feeding an existing <laughs> or or a non-existing online or offline. But that's that's basically it. It's about yeah, feeding, like inspiring to interest, learning more, etc. Um, Sam, do you have any? DAO community, community thoughts? Yeah, communities and DAOs and, you know, cooperatives in general, I think are famously uh, difficult uh, structures, you know? It's like trying to organize people at scale, productively, but not too productively because then there's probably too much hierarchy. So <laughs> <laughs> trying to find that sweet spot between kind of, um, yeah, a, a non-hierarchical form of organization and actually some kind of efficient um, efficient like outcome or, or efficient process and then eventual outcome. Um, I mean, you know, within Fingerprints, we're a group of over 200 members. The majority of those members are passive. They own our token and they are just happy to be associated with the, with the group. Um, there's a smaller group of people who are actively engaged on a weekly or even daily basis. But the way that we approached the curatorial process from right at the beginning was to elect a smaller group of people to oversee those decisions. So we have a sort of curatorial thesis or mandate that um, describes a sort of interpretation of what blockchain art or block, the medium of blockchain uh, sort of looks like. Um, and we have passed that into four categories, basically, um, that we assess works by. Um, and the DAO 
voted on that and approved that, and then it's in the hands of a you know closed committee to then um, make the decision as to whether we actually buy a work or not. So I bring that up because we've had to essentially exclude a lot of the community in order to have a very tightly focused um, collection. Because if we opened the process to 200 people, both we would risk members basically buying work before we were able to, which is a problem. Obviously, we trust our members, but you never know. Um, but also, it's really hard to come to consensus over something as abstract as, OK, is this a source of quasi-medium-specific instance of blockchain art or not when you're you know, debating among 200 people? Well, I bought this one, so I think, I think it is. <laughs> you guys should definitely buy it. Um, and then I'll buy some more yeah. before you do. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, um, so I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, I hope that we've, uh, you know, provided some interesting things to chew on. But if there are any uh, audience questions, can definitely take. A oh yeah, right on. Hello. Uh, well, first of all, I just arrived for this session, so so if I'm overlapping with what was told before, I think you, you've talked to, through it, but you never mentioned it. What is your role towards the media? Um, so when I interview a curator for an exhibition, he's trying to defend it, and with what you say, he's trying to defend it to say, okay, I love the art, not because you have to see this exhibition because it's expensive, what is uh, shown here, you see. Or um, if I see an art gallery, it's the same. So um, I think the media, they focus a lot on the novelty of the aspect. They focus a lot on the price. But the aesthetic, the artistic uh, approach is, for the moment, we, we don't know exactly well how to cover it. So what you, as curator, would you say to defend NFT toward the media? Mm. Well, I think you, you, you made a good uh, analogy with the cinema, uh, with the Marvel movie. It's the same thing. It's uh, NFTs is one, one thing. It's not an art movement. It might be a cultural movement, but not an art movement. So there are a lot of different things. And it's a bit like the movie industry. You have Marvels. You have the local artist cinema, and you have experimental cinema, and it's the same thing. And it's where the curators could come in and select, but it's true that it doesn't really exist. Uh, it's what we're trying to do with Altern, but it's very, very local, and we, we, we are not a, a professional organization, and, and it's true that it's missing, but, but then, uh, Maybe if it becomes normalized, it would go through the galleries and, you know, through the normal channel. It is extremely new, as I said before, we are before the beginning and at the moment it's a mess, it's a far west and things, but things, we just need the bubble to burst and then things will get better. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, I'm here. Thank you very much for this presentation. I'm in the field for more than one year and a half, and I'm actually opening a physical NFT gallery in the Medina of Tunis in the next two weeks. Uh, I just want to ask you something as curators, because we are always uh, listening, saying, hearing that uh, the blockchain technology is like the internet, is like cut, cutting the middlemen, and curators in the field of art are the ultimate middlemen. Uh, so basically, I think the role is going to change and you just approach it, but uh, I'm, more than, I, I'm more seeing the blockchain as a way for the middlemen to refine what they do, and to do it more specifically with more tools, and the blockchain is a wonderful tool that can be used in almost all the industries to refine what middlemen do. So basically my question is, you as curators, how do you see the refinement? And you approach it a little bit, but if one, each one of you can just say some kind of uh, key uh, take over on how is it going to transform your own curatorial practices and how you are going to, how do you experiment the change right now with this new technology applicated with the NFTs and things like that. Thanks. 
Um, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure that it's actually changed. I feel like it's the last few years. My role has changed that much within blockchain. Um, I've had. I've had to defend my my role as a curator a lot more than I've had before. Um, I guess maybe what is what it has. It has me made consider a bit more what I do, um, and I've had been. I've been thinking a lot more about like what what care actually means for me. Um, so yeah, it, it hasn't it hasn't really changed that much for me, and I think it's also really quite hard for me to say how it might change in the future. I think I think um, maybe the role of the curator might become more important in terms of actually bringing certain projects forward, being able to talk about them um, beyond the notion of the price, etc. Um, but yeah, as as of now, it hasn't really changed that much for me. Yeah, I think it's also. I mean, it's worth mentioning a lot of the major. Art NFT platforms, Foundation, Super Rare, Makers, Nifty, um, they all still take, uh, I think, somewhere around a 15% cut. So it's like they haven't really been eliminated. They just have really started being technology providers as opposed to kind of cultural laborers. Um, and so that's part of, I think, why we actually see some of the influencer culture that we do because those platforms uh, are only providing so much context and so much care for the work. And so it then lies upon the community to, of collectors to then give that visibility to the artist and give that visibility to the work. And so then we have these quasi curator collector influencers that um, have taken on that cultural labor and are doing it kind of in terms of equity as opposed to a cut of an initial initial sale price. Um, and so, I yeah, I don't really believe that we should be cutting out the, the curator middleman because they do a lot of work um, for, the, for the artists, um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's exactly it. Like cutting out the middleman completely means that you're putting all the work on the artist instead, which I think a lot of people uh, who also say that the middleman isn't needed doesn't necessarily understand what what the complexity of the art ecosystem and the complexity of a lot of the roles that we have within it and the, the function that we we, we all um, fill. Of course, there are roles that will be re reconsidered and maybe rethought. But um, I think also like a lot of them talking about cutting the middleman doesn't necessarily understand exactly how it functions. Certainly the um, sort of form of the intermediary is changing, right? I mean, we've spoken a lot about how collectors are actually assuming the role of a sort of almost gallery-like or museum-like or some kind of institutional um, uh, status um, when, uh, you know, in the form of DAOs, but also, I think we see individual collectors in the space um, become quite kind of powerful brokers. Um, I mean, one thing that is worth noting is, you know, a large part of the narrative around NFTs and how fantastic they are is that um, the positive argument is that artists are able to take a lot more of, a, of the primary sale um, proceeds, right? Whereas previously, maybe they were splitting 50-50 with a gallery, now they're taking 80% or they're taking 70%. And that is, like, for the most part, true. Um, but it does mean that they no longer have a gallery to represent them and they no longer have anyone to do their marketing for them. They no longer have anyone to do collector relations for them. And artists themselves are not necessarily the, you know, best people to do those roles. Not every artist wants to be a social media influencer, which is sort of the only way that if you're working independently, you can get your work out there. Um, it's not that I think we should be going back to 50-50 splits, but it is certainly a that sort of space, that sort of 30% margin is the space where I think the nature of the intermediary, you know, needs to kind of change and innovate. Um, so support artists without kind of going back to the old system. Hello. <laughs> so I want to come back on something that Patrick said before, and he said that... Uh, NFT is not an art movement, which I agree, NFT is a technology. Uh, but we have this notion of crypto art that comes a lot, and I didn't heard you say crypto art one time during this whole show. And for example, there was like an institution that is called uh, Museum of Crypto Art in Paris uh, by uh, Benoit Couty. And so I want to hear your mind of your creator about this notion of crypto art and what do you think? Is it a movement? Anything that's over? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I started to, to look at NFTs, I think, in 2000, early 2019. And then I think there was a crypto art movement. Uh, there was really something happening, and there was an aesthetic and an approach to art, I think, that was very specific. Now that it's more open, it, I, I think the crypto art thing, so they are still the original, I mean, what they call the OGs in a certain way that still exist and there are their followers, so there is still an aesthetic. But I, uh, so yes, it exists and it will certainly be a movement uh, seen as a movement in art history, but now there are a lot of different kind of movements in, uh, using NFTs, it's not necessary. I don't know what you think. Um, no, I totally agree. I mean, I was going to say, you said, you know, maybe we could call NFTs a cultural movement, you said before. I would certainly describe crypto art, the way that I interpret the term, to be a specific sort of movement, a specific um, sort of subculture within um, the NFT market um, that signifies a particular iconography um, which sort of mythologizes cryptocurrency and its kind of origins and the kind of broader kind of ideologies from which it was born. That's how I would understand crypto art. Um, you know, when you see those images that are, you know, have kind of Bitcoin logos or the Ethereum crystal or, um, you know, Pepe the Frog, the famous meme that was co-opted by the alt-right, those kinds of symbols are sort of some of the symbols of crypto art for me. Um, and I think what was interesting is that the market, to go back to the market quickly, the market last year began really by, by sort of um, placing this premium on crypto art. Maybe I would even call Beeple some kind of crypto artist, even though he only started making NFTs in late 2020. Um, that particular kind of work, and then the, it, the attention shifted towards a different kind of art that was also engaging with the blockchain, but more on a technical level. So art that was, um, art that was like storing all of the information necessary to recreate the work directly on the blockchain. So-called on-chain art, sort of um, supplanted crypto art as the hot thing. And we've never quite come back round in the cycle to the conversation coming back to crypto art. And I'm not sure that we ever quite will in the same way we did before. I hope not. Hi, I don't know if you still have time, but um, yeah. We'll do one more. <laughs> last, last one, last one. Last one. Johanna's going to kill me, but it's happening. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's just, it was more a set of uh, commentaries because I've been in this space for not a long time, since January, as a collector first and then as an artist. It's just funny, I'm an artist, but I started as a collector and I got really quite uh, addicted to it. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, and I've been noticing some some roles that the collectors are taking, which are quite new, I think, and we haven't uh, still mentioned, but one of the things that's quite current is for them to make uh, their galleries, to actually make their galleries. So we say, you mentioned that uh, collectors are like museums, but they're really making their cyber galleries, for example, and that's uh, quite common. Um, and they create the works, they don't show all the work, they actually do a creation somehow and dialogues between the works they own um, and so that's uh, and that really starts a conversation about their collections which is quite interesting when they share that and they tag all the artists I also saw some but I mean Tezos okay so I just know about Tezos and that's the world I live in but uh, it's interesting also uh, there was an, uh, cr uh, a collector who was worried about seeing a uh, large editions unsold. So he would uh, start a conversation, a public conversation on Twitter saying, I wish to start a project on buying the whole edition, burning part of it or, and gifting the other part. And, and so raising the floor of the artist uh, by making it a smaller edition and uh, making it more rare and more expensive. So actively kind of uh, uh, almost 
it's not even like a gallery, it's even more aggressive than that, but at the same time, with the approval of the, each artist, he would have a conversation, and then he would um, ask people around who wanted to be part of this gifting um, community, so he would give away to, he would like select some people randomly to receive the gifts, and he did that a few times, and I was happy enough to receive a few gifts like that, so um, that's, the type of stuff I find amazing and some high um, selling um, artists who are a Brazilian one, for example, is called Pixofu, who is quite famous. He started uh, a fund for, I'm Brazilian, okay, so I live here, but I'm Brazilian, so I know a lot about Brazilian scene. So I disagree with you, Patrick, when you say a lot of people just gamble. I, I just gamble, I never take out my Tezos, but a lot of Brazilian artists who had never lived before from art, they are now living from art, a lot. Also in Indonesia, also in, in yeah. specifically in Indonesia and Brazil, I see it a lot in Argentina too. And they, and people who had never had a, a gallery representation. So we speak about how the gallery is important, but how many artists really have gallery representation that works for them? It's a very small part, especially in the digital world. I mean, I've been an artist for 20 years and I never had a good relationship with a gallery. So, you know, it's, it's also a bit uh, naive to say that, oh, it's, it's too bad to take out the gallery role. Actually, is it really? I mean, for some people, yes, but for majority of people, they never get uh, a gallery representation. So they were always anyway working for themselves and, and working their ass off to get grants and stuff like that. And now, I see a lot of them specific, especially out of Europe, you know, we have to think this is a global thing. And Tezos community started in Brazil and South America and, and um, Asia is quite important in that, in that uh, world. So, I don't know, I, I see a lot of uh, movements that I never saw before. And I also see a lot of collectors who are just normal people. They don't come from the crypto. and. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm in a, like a private uh, collector group and some of them, it's like an older woman from France who's retired and never like, never knew anything about art. And now she's one of the biggest collectors in Tezos. And, and she said, I learned everything here with the artists, you know. So it's amazing, I mean, I don't know, I'm just, there's really very interesting examples and things happening and I still don't know how to understand it all, but what you mentioned about collectors being museums, being gallerists, and artists being collectors, it's a whole big mix. And so what's good or bad in this, I don't know. Yeah, 100 I mean, those are like really excellent points, the, the different types of curation that can occur with these like new financial models. And I know Alex wants to to hop, hop in. Yeah, I just want to say that um, the next uh, panel that we're doing is actually a roundtable, and I think what you're asking or talking about is really perfect for this conversation that's happening after. Um, and we do need a little bit of time to reorganize the room so we can all sit together. Um, so I think, you know, keep that thought and let's talk about it in the next session, if that's okay. And thank you very much, guys. Thank you.